Hello, friends, and welcome to another presentation from Prophet from Prophets, where prophecy speaks and prosperity follows. No, I'm not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, but I believe in the prophets. As the Bible says, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe in his prophets, so shall you prosper. Before we get into today's lesson, let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask for clarification, for wisdom, for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and for understanding of your truth in your word, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so today's subject, originally when I was thinking about this series, I was going to do, do only two, but uh, I think, you know, when you're talking about the subject of God, it's really an infinite subject. So doing only two presentations on this subject of God I think does a disservice to God and we need to answer some questions that some people have had and and maybe some people haven't thought that they had uh, specifically we're going to go today over the son how is Jesus begotten John 4 John 1 14 says and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth and the idea of Jesus being begotten, sometimes people don't understand what it means and they misapply it and they believe that Jesus somehow came into being in the distant past, in eternity past, or that, um, or that Jesus is not really fully God. And so we want to look at this subject in humility and see what the Bible says. Okay, we want to see what does the Bible say. How is Jesus begotten? All right. So let's just recap a little bit what we've learned so far in the previous two studies. If you haven't looked at those, please go ahead and look at those. Um, number one is the Bible applies the term Godhead to Jesus Christ as representing the fullness of deity. All right. Jesus Christ is the fullness of deity manifest to us here on earth. The Bible says that God while one is not single. We looked at that. God is one, but he is not single. The Bible says that this union between uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a mystery, right? Like that of the union between man and woman. Uh, they become one flesh in marriage, but yet they are not single. Or the unity that exists in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is made up of multiple people. It's made up of Jesus in connection with his church. So they are one, but they are not single. There is a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. The doctrine of the Trinity is of a pagan origin, and it is part of Catholic theology, while the doctrine of the Godhead is Bible-based. And there are two different ideas with regards to who God is and how he is. And we have to be specific, okay? We don't want to confuse people. And so I really, I really urge people to stop using the word Trinity. We do not believe in the Trinity. If you give it a meaning, that's your personal meaning. But the problem is that the actual theological meaning is completely different, and that causes confusion. We are believers in the Godhead. We believe in the Godhead. All right? And Ellen White clearly gives personhood and divinity to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, that's what we learned last time. Okay, so who is Jesus? All right, let's ask the term. Let's ask, who is Jesus? The term begotten with regard, who is Jesus with regards to being begotten? Okay, the term begotten means that a person is birthed or born from parents at a point in time, right? I'm begotten, right? You're begotten. Um, that's what it means. However, is this the meaning we can apply to Jesus. That is, does Jesus have a beginning in the way that humans have a beginning? Okay, humans start at a point in time. I did not exist from everlasting to everlasting. All right, I was born at some point on this earth. I'm not saying when, but I was born at some point, and uh, and here I am today talking to you. I don't. I was born at some point, and I'm going to go at some point, hopefully later than sooner. But uh, that is the condition of man. So let's take a look at John 
chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, what does it say? Who is Jesus? All right. In the beginning was the Word. And in context of John chapter 1, the Word here being referenced to is Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. All right. So what do we get from this? That Jesus has existed before anything came into being and thus could not have come into being himself. That means Jesus has existed from everlasting and will exist to everlasting. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. That's Jesus. Jesus, the Word, was God. God is God, so the Father is God, and, Je and the Word is God, right? They're both God. Again, they are one, but they are not single. The Bible clearly says this, right? So he must have existed forever like the Father. That's what the Bible is clearly saying here. Let's take a look at Jesus as the Creator. All right? What does the Bible say? In Ephesians 3, 9, it says this, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, okay, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So the Father created, and how did he create? By Jesus Christ. Right? Who created all things by Jesus Christ. So the Father is the creator, but he created all things by Jesus Christ, who is also the creator. And we learn in Genesis also that the Spirit was involved in the creation because the Spirit hovered over the waters. Right? So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were all involved in the creation, but Jesus is the active agent of creation. Colossians 1, 16-17 For by Him, Jesus Christ, were all things created. So the Father is involved. We saw that in Ephesians 3, 9. And Jesus is involved. And so here, Jesus is directly involved. We're created. Were all things created. And are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible, and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things. So he has to be before all created things. Therefore, he cannot be created. Right? Jesus cannot be created before because he is before all created things. And by him, all things consist. So all created things consist by him, and therefore he himself cannot be created, right? So we're getting the picture here that very plainly the Bible says that Jesus is from eternity God, like the Father is from eternity God. And that does not diminish Jesus, and it does not diminish the Father in saying that. Some people have a strange, I don't know, I don't know how to call it, a strange idea with regards to the relationship between the Father and the Son and believe that if you uphold Jesus too much, then you are denigrating the Father. But Jesus said clearly, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So if you're upholding Jesus, then you're upholding the Father. There's no, there's no one against the other here. People have some strange ideas that creep in. And I know Satan tries to do this. Satan tries to split Christians along these lines, but the Bible is very clear. Jesus is before all things. He's before anything that was made. Therefore, he himself did not come into being or was made at any point. Hebrews 1, 2 says the following, And hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, that is, the Father has spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. So again, this is, this is reinforcing that the Father made the worlds through the Son. Right? This is what the Bible is saying. These texts indicate that the Father created through Jesus as the executive agent, so the one who does the action. All things in heaven and earth were made by Jesus Christ. Therefore, in the beginning, God, plural, Elohim, right? Father, Son, and of course Holy Spirit also, but we're focusing a little bit more on the Father and the Son here, created heaven and earth. In the beginning, God, Elohim plural, created the heaven and the earth. 
Genesis 1.1. So how godlike is Jesus? I mean, I think we've pretty much answered that question. But let's bring the point home. All right, let's really, let's really bring the point home. So Philippians 2 verses 5 to 7 says the following. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. John 14, 9 says the following, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you? And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? All right. Exodus thirteen fourteen says the following, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am, hath sent me unto you. John 8, 58 says, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Right? So who's the God of the Old Testament? It's Jesus. Jesus is equal in every way because he is God. Now here's the point here. You see, Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And to be equal with God, you have to be equal in every way. Omnipotent, omniscient, you know, in every way. From everlasting to everlasting, you have to be equal with God. That's what it means to be equal with God. We are not equal with God. That's the lie of the devil. The devil wanted to be equal with God. He's not equal with God. The devil whispered in the, in the ears of Eve, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. But Eve was not equal with God, and neither is Adam. No human being, no one can be equal to God except God himself. But Jesus did what? But he made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant. You see, the Father didn't force Jesus to come down here and be our Savior. The Father loves you. The Son loves you. And the Son voluntarily took this position. He made himself. He did it himself because he is God. Only God can humble himself. Who's going to humble God? Are you going to humble God? Is the devil going to humble God? No. Is all the host of hell going to humble God? No. No, you won't. But I'll tell you who can humble God himself. He humbled himself, he made himself of no reputation, and took on him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And that's what Jesus did. He is the very God. He is equal with God. But this is what he did. He became like you and I, in many respects. Now, there are some respects he is not like us, of course. We're going to deal with that. In, a, in another lecture, because I think we're going to have to deal with the human nature of Christ. Now, this is a big topic, it's a hot topic, and it's a topic that deserves continued study. It's not something we need to be afraid of to study. We should study it, because the Bible speaks of it often, and so does the Spirit of Prophecy. We're going to get into that eventually. But suffice it to say that he was made in the likeness of men, not the unlikeness of men, in the likeness of men. This is, this is how God-like Jesus is. He is completely and utterly God. All right. So these are some texts that sometimes trip people up. Okay, Jesus, both Son and Father. What does the Bible say? Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Okay. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. All right. So what happens here is people will sometimes confuse this and think that Jesus is both the Son and the Father at the same time. This is not the case. Because while technically Jesus is the Father of our race, because we read before he is the Creator, but he is not the Father. Okay, so here this text is talking about Jesus in the future from Isaiah's perspective, from the past in our perspective, because it's already happened, right? So Jesus has a 
from you know when he became a human he has a human component right he's a child he's born he's a son and he's given okay so that means he gave up of himself remember john 3 16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son right so this is the human component that isaiah is speaking of under the inspiration of the holy spirit but there's also the divine component which is that god has the government he is called wonderful counselor the mighty god i mean that's pretty plain jesus is the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace that's jesus all right so here we see jesus as the everlasting father but not the father he's not the father there is a father there is the father right and technically jesus is the father of our race but he is not the father and as the begotten child okay so while his divine person has no beginning and is fully god he took on humanity at a point we already read this in the previous slide in time and therefore was begotten physically born as a human male so jesus who was the mighty god right humbled himself and became in the likeness of men at a point in time from our perspective right roughly you know a little over two thousand years ago and so this is this is what this text is saying this is what this text is saying that jesus that god himself which is the mighty god would come down would come down and become one with humanity and he does not remove his divinity but now he is both divine and human and that is something a covenant that he has made forever it cannot be broken what he did he did forever for eternity so again i wanted to point out that he is the everlasting father and that he has had no beginning and will have no end so does the word begotten always mean birthed okay this is what trips people up some people believe that jesus was merely a man some people believe that Jesus was a pretend man. That is, it was just a form walking around. Some people believe that Jesus came into being eons ago or in the distant past. But this is not the case. None of these things are the case. What does it mean in the Bible? Because they use the term begotten and they get mixed up. So Psalms 2 verse 7, what does it say? And I, this is talking about Jesus, I, Jesus, will declare the decree, the Lord who's the father here the lord hath said unto me jesus thou art my son so the father says to jesus you are my son thou art my son this day have i begotten thee the word begotten here is yalat all right it's the hebrew word yalat so in every instance the hebrew word yalat means to be birthed in nearly every instance it means to be birthed or born in a literal sense right it means to be born however not always of the rock that begat thee yalad thou art unmindful and has forgotten god that formed thee so this is moses speaking to the children of israel deuteronomy 32 18 so god did not literally birth the jewish nation so this is being taken symbolically he spiritually birthed them so to speak right and of course there wasn't a rock that begat them so this is speaking allegorically in a sense okay it's speaking in a sense but so we can see that the word yalad doesn't always mean physically birthed literally birthed now in what way therefore is jesus begotten in what way does jesus begotten here well it actually in uh in acts 13 33 so psalm 2 7 right is quoted in acts 13 33 and it says god hath fulfilled the same unto us their children in that he hath raised up jesus again so it's focusing on the resurrection also as it, it all as it is also written in the second psalm second psalm thou art my son this day have i begotten thee okay so therefore the begetting of psalm 2 7 is referring to the resurrection of jesus not to his birth not to a physical birth it's referring to the resurrection of jesus that is what it's referring to okay so what does john mean by only begotten son let's take a look 
Okay, John 1, 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. All right? Remember, I said that Jesus became a human being. And the Bible says that Jesus became a human being. So he dwelt, he became, he was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word, only begotten in the Greek, is monogenes. Okay, monogenes. Monogenes is a Greek word that is better translated as unique. Only one of his kind. It does not mean birthed or come into being. The focus of the word monogenes is the uniqueness of the person, right? Is the one of a kindness of the person, not the birthness of the person, all right? Now we can see this in Hebrews 11, 17 to 18. It says this, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he had received the promise, offered up his only begotten son, right? The monogenes. He that hath received the promised promises offered up his only begotten son, monogenes, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. But here's the thing. Abraham had Ishmael before Isaac. So how can Isaac be the monogenes, the only begotten? Can't be. Because Ishmael was born before Isaac and other children besides after Sarah died. Because Abraham had other children after Sarah died. So how can Isaac be the only begotten son? That doesn't fit. If you if if monogenes is talking about birth, but that's not what monogenes is talking about. That's not how the word is used. It means unique. Isaac is the only begotten in the sense that he is the unique son of promise. Right? And in this way, Jesus is also only begotten as the unique son of promise. Only begotten does not mean that Jesus was birthed or came into being in the distant past. It means that Jesus is the unique son of promise. That's how the word is supposed to be used. So, here we have monogenes versus gegenennon. Now you're wondering, what is this? Is this some type of uh, monster movie? No, it's not. Similarly, in respect to the five texts. This is quoting from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary. Similarly, in respect to the five texts in John's writing of Christ, the translation should be one of the following. Unique, precious, only, soul, the only one of his kind, but not only begotten. The translation, only begotten, here and elsewhere, apparently originated with the early fathers of the Catholic Church, and entered early English translations of the Bible under the influence of the Latin Vulgate, the official Bible of the Catholic Church. Accurately reflecting the Greek, various old Latin manuscripts which antedate the Vulgate, that is older than the Vulgate, read only rather than only begotten. Okay? So that's why, you know, only begotten is in the text, in the English, some of the English versions, but it's actually not a very good translation. It should be only precious soul, the only one of his kind. The idea that Christ was born of the Father before all creation appears first in the writings of origin. Okay? So the origin of the idea that Jesus came sometime in the past before all creation, that he, he came into being or was birthed, is from origin. Right? The writings of origin in AD 230. That's not biblical. Arius, nearly a century later, is the first to use Gegemnenon, the correct Greek word for begotten, when speaking of Christ, and to affirm that he was the begotten before all ages. This Greek word, Gegemnenon, is never used in the Bible concerning the pre incarnate Christ. The idea that Christ was begotten by the Father at some time in eternity past is altogether foreign to the Scriptures. All right? It's foreign to the Scriptures. The Bible does not say that Jesus came into some being and came into some time in eternity past. That's not what the Bible says. All right? All right, so how is Jesus the firstborn? 
So sometimes people get the firstborn mixed up. What does it mean? Prototokos. That's the word for the firstborn. And he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. All right. Uh, Luke 2, 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So this is talking about Mary, right? The first one, Matthew 125, is talking about Joseph and he names his son Jesus. And the second one talking about Mary, right? And she had no room in the inn. And she brought forth a firstborn son. So these two texts speak of Christ's human birth as the firstborn son of Mary. So in this way, he is her firstborn, okay? So yes, Jesus was born, but Jesus has existed from all eternity, okay? So that's what the firstborn means here. However, Romans 8, 29, For whom did he foreknow? He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So the firstborn among many brethren. This is how the Bible is applying the term firstborn. So this indicates here already and the idea of position. The firstborn among many brethren. Was Jesus the firstborn on earth? No. Adam was the firstborn on earth. Was Jesus the first believer in God? No. He wasn't the first believer in God. So this is a, the idea here is preeminence. It's position. We'll see this again in other texts. Colossians 1.15 Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Okay, now people say, aha, see? Jesus is the firstborn of every creature. Jesus was created before every creature. No. This is position. Position. Preeminence. Look at the next text. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Was Jesus the first person ever resurrected? No. Jesus himself resurrected people when he was on earth. And in the Old Testament, there was a man who was thrown into the grave of a prophet. And when the dead body touched the bones of the prophet, he was resurrected. That in all things he might have the preeminence. This is what these texts are talking about. The firstborn, when applied to Jesus, is about his preeminence, his position. Hebrews 1 6. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, these are all prototokos, by the way. Firstborn this is all prototokos. Into the world, he saith, and let all the angels worship him. These texts speak of Christ's firstborn status with reference to his preeminence or primacy, not as a literal firstborn. That's not that's not the issue that they're that they're raising. Again, more text. Hebrew eleven twenty eight. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Okay, this is the only text where the word prototokos is used for those other others and, and for others and not Jesus. All right? It refers to the literal firstborn of the children of Israel in the night of Passover. But in Hebrews 12, 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Revelation 1, 5, and from Jesus Christ was a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. Okay, again, was Jesus the first resurrected? No, he was not. But he is the first begotten of the dead. He is the, he is the, he has the preeminence over all the resurrected, right? And the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from the sins, from his, from our sins in his own blood. Again, these texts are used prototokos, uh, as to denote Christ's preeminence or position in relation to others. So how is Jesus the beginning of the creation of God? Revelation 3 says this, 3.14, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful true witness, the beginning, or arche, the Greek word arche, of the creation of God. So here people say, okay, well he's the beginning of the creation of God, so he was the first created being. No, Again, it's not what it says. Arche, which is the Greek word, has 58 occurrences. It's translated as beginning 40 times. It can use it can be used as beginning, but it also means the person or thing that commences, the first person or thing in a series, the leader, 
that by which anything begins to be, right? The origin, the active cause, right? The first place, principality, rule, or magistracy. So this is about position. Remember Colossians 1.15 says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Jesus is not the first created being. He is the prime cause of all creation. The word RK in Revelation 3.14, talking about Jesus as the beginning of the creation of God, is talking about his position as the creator. He is the one that started the whole thing. It doesn't mean that he had a beginning, right? It means that he started the whole thing. So what's the conclusion? What is the conclusion? The very one that created us is the very one that gave his life for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only unique son, that's how it should read, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only unique Son of God. And friends, my, my heart's desire, and I know it's the Lord's desire, is that you believe in the unique Son of God. Is that you put your faith in the mighty creator, because the one who made the worlds, the one who has lived from all eternity, the one who has been one with the Father, and the Father with him, that the Word was God, and the Word was with God, Father and Son, that Jesus Christ, who became in the likeness of men, is the one that loves you, and the one that saved you, the one that was given to you, Jesus is yours, and Jesus is mine. He belongs to us. Jesus belongs to us, and we belong to him. And if you don't belong to him, I urge you to call upon his name and ask, Lord, I want to belong to you right now. And even if you do, if, if you are a Christian, even then, say, Lord, I want to belong to you right now. Because you are my God, you are my creator, and you love me. Jesus is our creator and redeemer. Believe that he is God, fully God, completely God, and believe that he came to save you. There is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. There is no priest, no pastor, no king, no president, no committee, not even the devil himself can come between you and the Savior. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, the unique Son, full of grace and truth. And this is the truth. This is the truth. And to know Jesus, to have Jesus in your heart, is life everlasting. Don't you want it? I want it. You know, this world is not going to last much longer. And who knows how long our lives will last? We don't know. And so we pray to Jesus. We ask him, Lord Jesus, come into our heart. Save us, bring us your peace, cleanse us from sin, make us your children, and Lord, come quickly and take us home. Next week, friends, we're going to be dealing more specifically with the Holy Spirit, His person, work, and our greatest need. And I'd like to uh, ask again, if you found this video useful, if you like what's going on with this channel, please remember to subscribe and hit the like button. That would really help us out. And uh, leave a comment. Well, as the Bible says, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe in his prophets, so shall you prosper. Remember, friends, God is with us. He loves us. And he will be with us. Let's pray. Dear Father, be with us now. Help us to understand your goodness and your love. Lead and guide us according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for spending time with us today. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Bye now. Mm -hmm.